Okay, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, depending on where in the world you are. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, so now that we have given a couple of minutes for folks to join and get settled in, I think we're going to get started now. Um, the poll just came up, so you, you answered that. Uh, um, our seminar today, webinar today is entitled Youth in Action, Addressing Mental Health Together. Um, and my name is Alafia Samuels. I'm the chair of NCD Child. And today we're going to have a conversation on mental health and non-communicable diseases and what happened during the COVID-19 pandemic. We will hear from some young people on what it has been like to live with one or more NCDs during the pandemic. And we will hear from our partners about the innovative ways that young people and NGOs are meaningfully engaging with each other to promote mental um, health and physical well being. I'd like to introduce you to Dina Alzubi as our moderator for today's conversation. Dina is the Advocacy and Programs Development Manager at the Royal Health Awareness Society in Jordan. She's a clinical pharmacist by education, and she practices as such in the King Hussein cancer before shifting to public health. Welcome to public health and working on programs such as health school, healthy schools and um, the wash programs. I think that's a salt program. So Dina, welcome and over to you. Thank you very much, Alafia, and thank you for the introduction. Before we begin, I'd, I'd like just to cover one housekeeping uh, uh, topic for today's webinar. So our webinar today is being recorded, and we will share the link with you after the event is complete. Uh, we welcome uh, um, you to revisit the content later on yourself and, and share it with your colleagues and your networks as you, as you deem fit. Um, before we hear from our speakers today, I'd like to share the results of the poll question we we posed earlier. If you could, Laura, please just, yeah, great. So the question was, if young people in, in your respective countries engaged in advocacy, research, community initiatives, or conversations around mental health, and 55% of people said that they do, 20% of, of people said that they don't, and 25% of you said that they were not uh, sure. Those are definitely uh, some interesting um, answers. And um, after we've, we've heard, you know, these interesting uh, poll results, I want to begin by asking our speakers to kindly introduce themselves now. And uh, please mention the following information. So your current job title and institutional affiliation, if any, and the country that you're living in, and one thing that you wished others knew about mental health. So I'd like to begin with Joab, if that's okay with you, Joab. Thank you, Dina. So my name is Joab Wako and I am the founder and executive director of Transplant Education Kenya. I live here in Nairobi, Kenya. And one thing I wish others knew about mental health, like when I was reading really about mental health, is that mental health is a balance, is a state of balance, both within and with the environment. So I really like that it talked about balancing within and without. And I wish that more people would talk about that. Other people think it's just within. Thank you, Dina. Over to you. Oh, that's very insightful, Joab. Thank you very much. Bruno? Thank you, Dina. Thanks, everyone. It's a huge pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm Bruno Helman. I'm speaking from uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil. I am a person both living with type 1 diabetes and mental health conditions, such as depression and anxiety. Uh, I wear multiple hats, so I'm the founder and the president of Running for Diabetes, which is a, a nonprofit based in Brazil, which promotes the health and well-being of people living with NCDs. I'm also uh, privileged enough to be part of the uh, Young uh, Health Program, uh, sorry, Young Leader Program from uh, NCD Child. And I was reflecting a lot on your answer and sorry, but I have to cheat. I wasn't able to, to reach to one uh, thing that I, I would like people to, to know about living with mental health. So first, I think that I would say, and this goes like for the general public, is that living with mental health is not a choice. 
Uh, and secondly, and I think this is more like to those who face and navigate the, the challenge of living with a mental health condition is that on the importance of practicing uh, physical activity. So I just hope everyone uh, finds a, a sport, finds a, a, a physical activity that, that makes sense to them that they can fit their, uh, into their schedule and they really dive in into it because uh, this is something that has helped me a lot and I just wish everyone else find what makes them happy. Thank you, Bruno. I agree, physical activity is very important. Joanna? Hi, everyone. My name is Joanna. I'm a health specialist with UNICEF headquarters. Uh, the area of work that I focus on is adolescent health, mental health, and school health. So it's a pleasure to be here. You know, and if I, I could say something I wish um, people knew more about mental health or uh, in the way that we talk about it is that um, disorder and distress are really only an aspect of the, the experience that we as humans have with mental health and that the whole you know, spectrum matters. And I think um, the second thing is that young people go through such tremendous change physically, cognitively, psychosocially, and that everyone can benefit from support. Um, not only those people who have a certain challenges, you know, everybody can benefit from that support and everybody can benefit. I mean, all humans can benefit from taking care and investing in their mental health. Thank you, Joanna. I agree. Um, Rafael? Hello, everyone. My name is Rafael Ribeiro. I'm 20 years old. Uh, I, I speak from the outskirts of the Brazilian capital. I'm also a young leader and a student currently in the third year of uh, studying political sciences at the University of Brasilia, and now I work with Gabi in the Engajada Means project. And I wanted people to know that managing mental health is not a punctual activity, but it's a constant and ever-developing exercise. And I say that based on my own experience. That's it. Thank you, Rafael. Cristina? Hi, my name is Cristina. I'm 20 years old. Uh, I live and grew up in Medway, Kent, which is in England, and I'm currently in my second year at the University of Southampton doing a master's in physics and astronomy. Um, I participated in peer support with Oxford University, so Gabby and Youth Era, as well as locally participating in youth councils, um, talking to local po politicians and health experts on mental health. I myself suffer from depression and anxiety also. And one thing I wish that others knew about mental health is that it is actually okay to not be okay. Now that's, a, that's a great motto. It's okay not to be okay. Thank you, Christina. Gabriella? Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, so my name is Gabby and I'm a research fellow at Oxford Population Health in the UK. Uh, and I work on mental health and also digital innovation. And one thing I'd like people to know about mental health is that mental health is a social and political issue uh, as well as other things. So I think these factors are often neglected, but I think we cannot address mental health without addressing this wider determinants uh, such as people's living conditions, et cetera. So, so just to raise awareness of that. Thank you so much, Gabriella. Chantal? Hello everyone, I'm connecting with you from Durban in South Africa. I'm an independent consultant, a global mental health advocate who also lives with a mental health condition. And I'm also a social impact entrepreneur who works with various local and international organizations. I have a particular interest in creating evidence and solutions to support the mental well-being of young people. So this is right up my alley. Um, so one thing I wish everyone would know about mental health is that people's experiences with the world around them are very unique. And while mental health challenges are often framed as a biological health issue, we now know that the different kinds of experiences and environments have a major impact on a person's mental well-being. But it also means that different kinds of treatments and therapies can be used to alleviate mental health problems. Thank you. Oh, that's very powerful, Chantal. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for these amazing and already inspiring introductions. And before we move into and take the deep dive into the question, we're going to share some mental health resources in the chat box uh, um, now. And if you or someone you know needs 
and requires mental health support, please seek help. Uh, you are not alone. So you're going to see these um, links and resources right now in the chat box. Please um, take a look. And I'm going to start with Bruno and Joab, and I'm going to pose the first question to you guys. Um, could you please tell us, to the extent that you're comfortable, of course, what has it been like to manage a chronic illness uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic? And do you think that there are any coping mechanisms that you found you know, particularly useful? Joab, would you like to go first? Yeah, let's Joab go first. OK, Bruno. <laughs> All right, I'll go. so I, I didn't introduce that. I actually had a kidney transplant about six years ago. So I went through chronic kidney disease in 2015. And the onset of COVID was, was very stressful. Uh, it was quite stressful. And there was an initial panic in the country when the first COVID-19 uh, case was detected in Kenya in March of 2020. And the medicines and the access to healthcare services became very difficult as the country decided to, you know, adjust accordingly to take care of the COVID, the rapidly rising number of COVID cases, which led to insomnia. I couldn't really sleep during the initial first months and kind of a panic. I think the whole country was in a panic and I was panicking too, because like everyone else, it was, we were so uncertain about the future, you know, and I am on medication that I have to import. So now I had to start thinking about how am I going to get my medication despite everything that's going on. So that led to quite a lot of anxiety, you know, because being immunocompromised, uh, on top of that, after the kidney transplant, we, we were still, uh, we're, we are and we're considered high risk, essentially. So I had to isolate as much as possible. And as a person living with an NCD, we had like worse outcomes when we got COVID-19 and that was publicized by the government. So in fact, our government announced how people living with diabetes and hypertension were at high risk of COVID-19, like severe symptoms of COVID-19 and possibly dying. So they even had a count of infection rates in the country and how many people had died. And of those people living with NCDs were proportionally higher than the, the general population. So I was really worried that when I got COVID, um, I would have to be admitted in hospital. And that was really, really worrying because the insurance companies would not cover the cost. Initially, they would just leave you to cover those costs yourself. And that was really difficult for me. Uh, additionally, like I, I couldn't meet friends, like no one could meet or even my doctor. Uh, and many of my friends in the post-transplant clinics, uh, they were closed indefinitely. So we couldn't even access care, you know? So that forced us as, as transplant recipients to go in longer periods. So initially we were supposed to go about two to three months between yeah. our checkups and it extended. It had to extend to closer to five, six months between seeing our doctors. So that really affected the care uh, of our, our community and people living with NCDs because we, we couldn't access doctors or for medication. So we had to come together and see how we can help each other. So that's what I was trying really, to do. It, yeah. yes. It's really amazing how, you know, similar the, the you, you know, the conditions that people living with NCDs uh, were in different countries around the world. Bruno, would you care to let, tell us a little bit about your experience? I would say that uh, living with type one diabetes in a, in a, in a, in a setting in a in a in an environment that you are locked down, it's mm -hmm. uh, really challenging, especially because uh, we all know that that physical uh, activities are uh, an important component of the diabetes management. Yeah. But I would say that the, the biggest impact uh, when it comes uh, to the, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, for me, it was in the, in the end of 2020. So during the lockdown, I kind of tried to find uh, different ways that I could exercise. 
And then I found out, so I have a, a younger brother and we found out together that like playing uh, basketball in a, in a small court that we, that we have in a uh, apartment building uh, would be uh, a great way, not only to, to connect, but also uh, to release stress. So we kind of try to play every single day uh, in, in, the, in the end of, of, of the, the working hours. And it was like something that we, we were building together and trying to you know, cope and navigate with all the external world that we, we, we were struggling with. But then uh, at one day I, I was playing with him and I twisted my ankle and I ended up uh, breaking one of my toes. And because of that, I had not only to stop uh, playing basketball, but I, I wasn't able to, uh, to do any type of uh, physical activity. And in that moment, I would say it was one of, the biggest struggles that I uh, that I face in a really uh, in common and really uh, stressful situation, not being able to you know to to walk, uh, it it uh, worsened the 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 whole the whole cause. So honestly speaking, how I I dealt with it, honestly I didn't like I kept my diabetes management, I kept doing therapy, I kept doing, uh, taking the, uh, the, the antidepressive and all the, the medication uh, needed. But in the end, when it comes to the, my, my mood and how I was feeling like, I mean, I was just so unhappy and so uh, unmotivated, you know, I, di I didn't, even though I, it was a small surgery and uh, the, the prognosis was that I was being able to, to go back running in X, uh, X uh, months. Yeah. Uh, in, in the end, it was really challenging. So honestly, uh, I would say that on that specific period of, of the pandemic, I didn't cope. Yeah, that's definitely understandable. And, you know, the, I think hearing about your experiences during the pandemic really allows me to um understand better i think and and just get some insights on on you know what was happening and what people living with ncds um you know ha had to deal with uh, during the pandemic and i'd like to move to joanna from unicef uh because joanna we know that unicef you know is doing quite a bit to respond to the mental health needs of of young people could you please just tell us a little bit about some of these initiatives or projects um that, that you worked on Yes, sure. Um, and, and just kind of building upon what some of the others have already said too, that the right for an adolescent and a young person to be heard and a young person's right to mental health are really at the core of uh, UNICEF's work and our, our organizational priorities as well. And so what we're kind of focused on is how we can bring those two priorities together and how we can uh, do better and further build our capacity and, and of those that we're working with um, and the tools that we have to facilitate meaningful and safe engagement of young people in you know, mental health research, programming, advocacy. Um, and a couple of things we have in relation to that is that uh, we have a child and youth uh, participatory research initiative that's meant to inform a model for how we can engage with young people more systematically uh, in mental health research, um, communication and action. Um, and the findings and the tools um, from this work will be shortly available to, to everyone. We are also, we've also developed and are now in the, the field testing phase of a protocol. Some, I think some of you guys here have been involved with this too. A protocol to increase safe um, and meaningful participation of young people with a focus on um, their mental health uh, and psychosocial well-being. So it provides practical training um, for different organizations and people working with young people, um, practical training and guidance on how to better safeguard their mental health and, and well-being during or before, during, and after different participation processes um, in different aspects of programming. Um, and something else, you know, that so many of you here have also mentioned that um, 
mental health you know, is so profoundly affected by the world in which we live. And so therefore the answers and the keys to, to improving our mental health also very much lie in those contexts. And so together with WHO, you know, we are having several initiatives that really focus on um, efforts to promote positive home, school, uh, and community environments, uh, as well as skills building for young people towards uh, improved mental well-being. We know that improving both the internal resources are important, but also um, really looking at the environment with which with they live, the support, um, the things that promote their well-being. Um, and so there's two packages. I'm happy to put it in the, the chat in a moment. It's uh, helping, um, helping adolescents thrive. It's a toolkit that kind of outlines four strategies, looking at um, the, the socio-ecological model and then um, help uh, health promoting schools. Uh, and these are two kind of packages of tools and initiatives that, that we use to really work with national and subnational government and partners to address some of those um, needs that young people have in terms of service, but also uh, promotion um, yeah. and importantly with caregivers as well. Yeah, that sounds really great, um, Joanna. And I think working to to create this enabling environment that is conducive to you know um, youth who are mentally healthy is really the key to getting to what Joab so eloquently described as balance from within and and without. So it's really great to hear about all of these initiatives, and um, and and to hear about all of these you know supportive interventions to youth. And I think this would be a good place to talk to you, Christina, and since we're since we're on the topic of supportive interventions, if you could tell us a little bit about your experience with, you know, peer to peer support, especially during the pandemic. Yeah, so during COVID, I became part of the Uplift program, which was set up by Oxford University and Youth Era, which is an American youth group thing south in Oregon, America. Uh, through this program, I've participated in many different activities, which included doing wellness charts, uh, doing calls, checking in on e like each other. Um, we learned how to find our purpose during the pandemic and like how to listen to other people's issues, um, as well as how to act in an emergency, just in case there was one. The training lasted for about five days uh, and it went on for a full day. It was over Zoom, obviously, because we couldn't see each other in the pandemic. Um, but after the training, I used these skills on like friends and family, as well as strangers, just to check up on them, see if they're okay. Um, after a few months, uh, I was invited back along with a few others to be a group leader, to mentor others on this, um, how to help others through COVID. So I would teach them everything that I went uh, through and everything I got taught previously. Um, so this lasted a week. Uh, with a few hours each day so they again um, learned the same skills um, and it was called coping during covid where um, we helped them help others find their purpose during covid um, they did wellness charts how to act in emergency and how to listen to others uh, now that it's over i am part of the tune with gabby a newly set up ypag with oxford university um, it meant a lot to me to be able to help others and um, help others gain those same skills because no one should be able, uh, no one should suffer alone in their struggles and these skills could be used after lockdown uh, after the lockdown was over it didn't just have to be a covid thing um covid meant that a lot of people were isolated but this program helped bring people closer together and support each other a lot more thank you so much christina and i think you know, someone mentioned it in the beginning of the webinar today when they said everybody needs support. I think it was you, Joanna. So everybody needs support, right? Um, even if you're not diagnosed with a mental illness, um, you know, you could always benefit from somebody else just supporting you. And it's really interesting to hear about the Uplift uh, uh, project. And um, Raphael, I know you've also worked with young people. And I know that you're working on the solution to facilitate young people's engagement with mental health. If you could tell us a little bit about that solution, and maybe you could tell us about how young people are already engaging uh, with mental health in their communities. So, well, it's kind of amazing. Uh, we're developing a chat story 
a chat bot. A chat story is an interactive narrative, and ours has the goal of enhancing youth protagonists by incorporating a few game mechanics on it. But it is not like a simple game. It's actually a tool to promote and discuss mental health related issues. So all the characters we created and their personalities are based on the data we collected through the focus groups the ad during the qualitative phase of the research, the, the interviewing phase of the research. That way uh, we can create user identification and catch young people attention. So uh, the chat story shows some of the problems and worries commonly shared by young people and also by me because I'm a young person and how they and we deal with them. So we also aim to test and boost awareness, peer support and activists amongst the youth and collect more data for further analysis during using the, the, the chat story and uh, using our tool. Uh, and actually answering the second question, our conversations with the adolescents in Brazil made it really clear how strong and resilient young people can be when facing adversities, you know? Like personally, I got fascinated by how many projects uh, and, and actions led by young people we found in my country, you know? Uh, they may not be always, they not, may not always address mental health specifically, but they have a direct impact on building safe environments uh, that allow free expression for young people where they feel validated and heard. Those actions uh, commonly manifested themselves in school projects, LGBTQ plus community supports, support communities, religious activities, and even online events, you know, so a lot of things. And that's it. Yeah, thank you so much, Rafael. I'm curious about any barriers that you might have faced during the research. Um, would you like to share a few or one? So that's actually a really good question, the barriers. So one of our greatest challenges uh, was choosing which topics to address and which topics to leave out. Uh, we had to be really diplomatic about what we wanted and what we could do and mention. Uh, like, actually, we found out we couldn't address certain topics in our chat story because we wanted the tool to be incorporated in high school, in the high school system. Uh, then we had to suppress some specific things in order to reduce risks and maximize the chances that disintegration uh, could happen. And unfortunately, like, uh, because Brazil has a predominantly conservative population, talking about certain things like LGBTQ plus rise in identification, different creeds, feminism, among others, would certainly produce, produce instant, and, instant social and political backlash. And we have seen that before. So mm -hmm. we try to avoid that as much as it's possible. And beyond that, we, with the chat story, we also wanted to emphasize this school potential and provide positive models so yeah. we let out, we left out reference to sexual harassment conducted by teachers, structural negligence, and lack of emotional support, which has right. been frequently mentioned by young people. And that's a shame because it's on school and yeah. it's where R2 can be most effective in making difference. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing, uh, Rafael. And uh, before we move on to the next question, uh, we have another poll uh, for you. And uh, before we hear from, from uh, Gabriella today, and the question is, what do schools need to do to, to help young people take action for better mental health and well-being? If we could just take a moment and, and answer the, the poll question. Okay, the, these are some very close results. So zero people, zero percent of people think it's not the school's responsibility. I couldn't agree more. Um, around 80% think that uh, classes should be offered about mental health and platforms around 80% as well think that platforms should be provided to speak about ideas. 88% um, think they, the school, that schools should offer support to cope and 88% also believe that we need to create opportunities for youth to connect with each other. So um, I think th these are some really powerful ways uh, to, to take action for better mental health and well-being. Thank you everyone for answering. And just um, Gabriella, you know, we've heard about a lot of projects and initiatives so far, and this makes me think a little bit about co-production. So if you could tell us a little bit more about co-production or meaningful engagement of young people in the mental health agenda. And, um, you know, also Raphael, you know, talked a little bit uh, about barriers, but we also want to hear from you about barriers that relate to, to co-production and how we can um, address them. 
Thank you. Yeah, for sure. So co-production is a collaborative mode of working uh, where professionals partner up with young people to do research or to develop policy interventions uh, working together. So young people have been traditionally involved uh, in a more passive way as subjects of research or recipients of services. Uh, and unfortunately, many interventions end up failing because they don't take into account what young people value, what young people like, um, where they are, what they use, etc. So co-production allows us to work in partnership to really understand what the needs of young people are and to come up together with solutions that could be effective, engaging, and also acceptable for them. Uh, on your second question about barriers, uh, I think co-production is still very new. So together with uh, Chantel and Joanna, we've been trying to map uh, sort of where co-production is used and the reasons why and the sort of barriers that young people face for co-production. Uh, and we found in one of the mapping exercises that only 5% of empirical research papers in adolescent health would mention involving a young person's advisor group, for example. So there's a lot of room for improvement there. Uh, and I think in terms of research specifically, I think we need a, a structural change to be able to create different research culture that would actually incorporate co-production. So for example, training early career researchers, having funding opportunities that would allow researchers to set up advisory groups. Uh, and then all the changes like, you know, valuing this in the research culture, for example, making young people's involvement a requirement for grant proposals or a requirement for papers. Uh, all of this could help in terms of changing the culture, uh, but also need youth representation in spaces where we make decisions like young people as co-editors in journals, co-reviewers sitting in academic events together, like we're doing right now, you know, those types of things, they need to happen more often so that young people can participate in making those decisions. And young people must be trained to express themselves, but the adults also must be trained to listen to young people and, mm -hmm. and sort of incorporate a follow through. Thank you so much, Gabriella. I think it's really insightful what you've mentioned because as you know, the, the, the global health community started moving towards increased youth engagement, we've noticed a little bit of tokenism going on. And you know what we, you talked about today about making sure that young people sit on decision-making tables, not just you know, getting involved with this, you know, yeah, Raphael is doing all of the motions. Um, so th that's really, really important. And Raphael, since you're, you know, motioning with your hands, could you tell us a little bit about your experience with co-production? Because I know you've worked with Gabriella on this. So co-production is, is really constructive. Uh, like we were talking about putting people with master's and doctor's degrees with young adults that are not even graduated to completely different groups. So but that discrepancy, that difference, does not mean an imbalance on how much each group contributes to the research. The senior researchers have the academic skills, yes, of course, uh, but we had the personal experience and, prat and practical knowledge to construe and unravel this massive pool of data that the younger generations can be, you know, like try to understand our humor or, or, or online communications or vocabulary and problems, and, and you get what I'm talking about. It's, it's hard and confusing. So that's our main job to be young protagonists guiding the senior researchers and the research itself. But the co-production has its drawbacks too. It can be really, really frustrating when the progress is not made, when the communication be between the groups is failing, when there is no equity on tasks, when there's a strict hierarchy that creates tension and silence new ideas. Uh, it can get really overwhelming. And we dealt with that. It's, it's a natural problem, uh, that those kind of things. And we dealt with that by, uh, you know, we made a priority to be open and honest with each other, uh, with one another, giving ourselves space to reflect and adjust, uh, not like two groups separate, but as a singular whole body. Uh, we worked together, we bound it up, and we solved our issues to create a healthy workplace. So that's my take. Co-production is hard and challenging, but it's also really, really amazing. Yeah, it sounds great, honestly, and uh, it's great to be able to hear from both, uh, you know, Gabriella and, and your side as well, just to have this like full picture of what co-production is like for everybody. Yes, with all of the hand movements. Um, and I'd like to pivot a little bit now to hear more about the My Mind, Our Humanity campaign. So Chantal, you're here with us. If you can just share some findings from the paper. I know that it's called Agents of Change for Mental Health, the Perspectives of Young People in Low Middle Income Countries. So if you could tell us a little bit about the findings of um, that you've mentioned on this paper. And I'd personally like to know if any of these findings surprised you.
I'm on mute. Yes, I saw that. Um, thank you, Dina, and thank you to my colleagues. Um, I wonder if I could just give a quick um, background to the My Mind Our Humanity campaign, just for those who don't know. Um, so the Lancet Commission report on global mental health and sustainable development was released in 2018. And in the leading up to the launch of this report, there was 30 young people from different countries that were nominated to create a global campaign. And this was really to integrate the voices of young people into global mental health debate and create more accessible ways of um, you know, communicating these key findings to report to young people. This initiative turned out to be incredibly successful and it evolved into a movement that none of us actually um, anticipated from the start. But the platform really facilitated the leadership of mental health advocates who are now able to speak on many global health platforms, engage in meaningful discussions, and also participate in research. So they're also leading and co-creating policies, policy briefs, and community-based programs that, that positively impacts broader communities. So it's really just driving home um, the elements that um, Rafael and, and Gabby was talking about. So, you know, when I come to the research paper that you mentioned, um, this is really a result of an almost four year initiative that was led by our My Mind, Our Humanity team, um, together with UNICEF and Oxford University. The study was focused um, specifically on the perspectives of young people in low and middle income countries, um, especially when considering the transformation of global mental health and their aspirations for meaningful involvement. So you may know that you know, the world is home to 1.2 billion young people aged between 15 and 24 years old. And almost 90% of those young people live in low and middle income countries. So among young people, mental health conditions and substance use disorders are the leading cause of disability. And most disorders originate before their mid twenties. The problem we then try to address in this study was is the fact that millions of young people are facing mental health challenges, yet there's neither accessible nor youth friendly uh, support services. So our efforts to tackle the problem largely excludes young people from decision making and youth led interventions are not part of mental health service provision or even a priority in many countries. So effective mental health prevention and promotion require recognizing young persons right to participate as Gabby mentioned earlier and their powerful role as agents for change in their own mental health and well-being an urgent opportunity exists to develop an upscale innovative prevention and early intervention approaches that target and engage young people such as social prescribing um, peer-led initiatives and digital tools as my colleagues have elaborated on earlier so all of this, and we know, we still know very little about young people's own perspectives on how they wish to engage, where they feel their actions can make the most difference and what they need to achieve that. So to support meaningful participation in, in youth in promoting mental health and wellbeing initiative, the study investigated young people's four domains of participatory engagement. The first is their aspirations for engagement. The second was their spheres of influence. The third was their capacity building needs. And then the fourth was the key barriers to their participation. And we also posed four key survey questions that was distributed on the UNICEF U Report social messaging, social messaging tool and data collection platform between February and March 2020. And as you noted, this is pre pandemic. Um, as a result, there were almost, oh, I think there's over 42,000 respondents of ages between 15 and 29 in five low and middle income countries. And most of these respondents were from Brazil, Burundi, Jamaica, Nigeria, and South Africa. So across these countries, people have reported, young people have reported aspirations to join a mental health project and to engage in peer to peer initiatives. Participants also considered schools and community settings to be the most critical spheres for participatory engagement. 
and reported a lack of information about mental health as a key barrier to engage in community mental health and well-being, all of which was also reflected in the poll that we saw, saw earlier. So to answer your second question, the results didn't really surprise me personally, to be honest, as the findings really have highlighted some of the social conversations and the activism that young people have been busy with for quite some time. So I think many young people have a desire to make a positive change in their communities. So given giving them appropriate resources and opportunities, young people can really be key agents for promoting mental health and well-being in their communities. Thanks. Thank you so much, um, Chantal. I love what you said. Young people are key agents to, you know, men mental well-being and mental health, especially their own. And I agree with you. I think young people have this, you know, um, civic energy that really is just looking to to be be used right for for to further the mental health agenda. And we have one final poll question uh, today. Oh no, before that, I just want to ask uh, Bruno and Joab uh, a question and then we can move to the, to the poll question. So, you know, uh, Chantelle talking about this research, she, she mentioned that it has been going on since four years and that it was in the pandemic era, uh, so to speak, and that the findings, um, you know, we, they were, they were before the, the, the whole COVID pandemic happened. And maybe we would like to know today if those findings still hold true today. And you know, what was your experience uh, um, in, in your countries with regards to this? If you could, um, if we could now start with Bruno. Bruno, would you like to begin? Sure. So, you know, I would say one of the most horrifying but not surprising findings of these studies is the, the lack of knowledge on mental health, uh, I would say, and without romanticizing, please don't take me wrong, but I would say at least one of the good things, if we can put this way of the pandemic, would be the amount of awareness uh, raised uh, towards mental health. I think that people and mostly youth uh, become more vocal about it. And I think we are starting to, to change the, the reality. But again, that doesn't mean uh, there's no a, a, a very long and tough and full of bumps uh, road to, uh, to be pursued. So I would say that maybe if the, if the, if the study uh, would be conducted after the pandemic, these numbers might slightly change, but again, that doesn't necessarily will reflect on better uh, mental health policies uh, to to address uh, youth overall well-being. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bruno. Joab, can you tell us a little bit about how how you perceive the, these findings and if they relate to the current condition in in the pandemic era? Uh, um, thank you, Chantal, for presenting that. I, I feel they're still very relevant to today, uh, post-COVID. Uh, in fact, the, the part of the, the schools and during pandemic, most of the schools here were closed. And a lot of our students couldn't even access school because of there was no access. So there was no platforms youth and the children to meet and actually encourage each other. So COVID just showed that the lack of mental health care and services and how they're not accessible to young, to the youth and to the young adults, um, it just showed that it exposed that here in Kenya. And there's a lot of need to create the same maintenance status, if you can still hear me. Um, there's a lot of need to create those platforms for peer, you know, peer-to-peer -peer support outside of school, you know? So I feel that the COVID pandemic showed us that, okay, if school is taken out, are there any support systems for youth and for young adults? So they're, they're still relevant and we, we do have a long way to go in terms of getting mental health where it's supposed to be here in Kenya. We still have a lot of stigma around it, so we don't talk much about it. So I really believe that it's, it's still very relevant and we can build those structures uh, post-COVID. Thank you. 
Thank you, Joa. Definitely. I mean, schools being out and, and especially during lockdown, it, it just highlighted the fact that we need really need we really need to diversify the ways that we provide support to, to, to young people. Thank you so much. And um, we have one more poll question for you. So now that we've heard from Joab and Bruno on what they think about these findings and whether they ho still hold true, please, um, if you could please answer the, the poll question. Do you think that any of these pre-pandemic findings still hold true today, considering your lived experience? Oh, very interesting. So 42% think that all of the above uh, uh, findings are still true. And um, the lack of information about mental health um, uh, answer got actually the highest uh, uh, vote among, among um, all of the three options following the, all of the above. So these are very, um, you know, interesting uh, findings. And um, I think we, we, we can move on now. And I'd like really to pose a question to all of the four amazing young leaders that we have with us here today. So if you can, in 10 words or less, um, just tell us about, you know, we've talked about a few of them, but what are some resources or ways of support that you think are still lacking uh, for youth in the mental health space? Christina, would you like to? Um... Uh, safe spaces and peer support. Safe spaces and peer support. Well, five words, that's great. <laughs> Raphael? Space itself, like environments where young people are heard and validated. Exact, exactly 10 words that I counted. <laughs> Good job. Um, Bruno or Joab? Bruno, okay. <laughs> okay, so I'm still thinking about it, but for me, peer support. Peer support. Peer support. Is, yeah. yeah. Bruno? I think being heard and being institutionally involved on policy making process. Mm -hmm. So we've heard that more than once uh, today. So being what, what you call institutionally heard or, or just sitting at the policy making and decision making table. You know, that, that's very important as well. Um, thank you. And before we close you know, our event today, um, I'd like to ask Chantel if, if you could just tell us about what you're hoping to do with these uh, findings from um, the My Mind, My Humanity uh, campaign. And you know, if there are any partnerships or, or you know, forms of support that you're looking for in order to further the action on, on the mental health agenda. Absolutely, thank you, Dina. Um, so my Mind Our Humanity campaign initially actually started as a one year project, but it eventually our little group consisting of mental health activists and many with lived experience with mental health challenges we just kind of stuck together and wanted to keep collaborating and push the boundaries where we can. So this culmination of a large following of social media, our publications and social brief, um, policy briefs, opinion pieces and research papers, um, you know, we've really solidified our engagement in the global mental health debates. So I think as, as at the moment, um, as the, gr the group remains quite informal, but it has engaged in various global and national organizations as advisors or consultants, board members and representatives applying each individual skills and expertise. So, you know, that being said, we're always open to partnerships and hope to collaborate either as a collective, as a group, or on an individual basis with groups and organizations focusing on, on health and well-being. And in, in particular, uh, with regards to the research paper, it was presented on three occasions last year, two, um, two of which was at global conferences. And then uh, I also presented at a strategic national conference at a, a mental health symposium in South Africa. Um, and, you know, it will also be included in the UNICEF State of the World's Children Report. So, of course, we are happy to connect with any other partnerships on this work and help us continue raising young people's voices in national, regional and global mental health. 
Thank you so much, Chantal. I mean, that's just a great way to, to end today's uh, webinar, you know, looking for ways to raising the voices of, of young people. And um, I'd like to end, if, if you would allow me, by really thanking every single one of you today and, and to all of you who are listening to us out there, you know, just carrying the cause of mental health within your heart and taking it forward in, in the different ways that you are. And I'd like maybe to just how, like mention a few statements um, from our conversation today that I'm going to look back at and reflect on because they were so powerful. Um, everyone needs support. Balance from within and without. It's okay not to be okay. Young people are key to positive change in mental health and young people need to be institutionally heard. I think those are very powerful statements that, you know, I, I summarized from, from our, our conversation today and I quoted uh, you guys as, as we were going on. And um, today was definitely interesting and this past hour has been definitely insightful and inspiring. Thank you, everyone.